Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we're going to discuss a small part of algebraic topology dealing with knot theory. So first of all, what is a knot? Well, you've probably encountered these objects before in your life, but mathematically a knot is a closed piece of string in three space. So here's, for example, a representation. Here I have a belt, um, and if I tie it like so, oh. <laughs> learned to tie my shoes in third grade, but still getting the hang of it. Okay, so I tie it like so, and close the clasp. Now it's a closed piece of string. And here's a question. Uh, looking at this thing, can I ever untangle it? In other words, without unclasping this end, can I ever just make this into a uniform loop that will, for example, feel comfortable around my waist? Uh, and it turns out the answer is no. And this entire class will be dedicated to proving that this knot, it's called the trefoil knot, can never be undone without cutting the belt. So let's get to it. So like I mentioned, intuitively, a knot is a closed piece of string in three-dimensional space. And here are three examples of such knots. On the left, we have the trefoil knot. In the middle, we have what's called the figure eight knot. And on the right, we have the unknot. And it turns out that all of these are actually different knots. So. Any mathematical object is always considered up to some equivalence relation. So knots are considered up to continuous deformations, as most things in this class. But we're going to have an extra rule, uh, but no passing through itself. So in other words, uh, here is a sequence of continuous deformations. I have one strand of the knot under the other strand. There's a second where it touches itself, and then it goes past itself, and this is explicitly disallowed. Great. So let's get formal with what everything really means. Let X and Y be topological spaces. Then an embedding of X into Y is a map F from x to y, which is a homeomorphism onto its image. So I'll give you an example here. Uh, if I have a map S1 to R2, which takes the circle into, okay, so here's R2, and it maps it all around like this, uh, let me just make sure I meet the ends here. This is an embedding. Uh, I think more illustrative is to give you a non-example. If I have a map from S1 to R2, which takes the circle into this figure eight position, this is not an embedding. And what's the problem? Well, remember, a homeomorphism is surjective, injective, and continuous. So obviously, this map is surjective onto its image. It's a little silly. But the map is not injective. And here, it's not injective. There's a self-crossing, essentially. Okay, 
So let's have one more definition. An isotopy of a topological space X is a map F from X cross I into Y or let me uh, not be so coy and just call the space X so that for each T in I F restricted from X cross T into X is a homeomorphism. So in other words, an isotopy is a homotopy, but at each slice of the homotopy, you actually have something stronger, a homeomorphism. And now we can get into our formal definitions of knots and their equivalents. So here's the definition. A knot is an embedding F from S1 to R3, which can locally be approximated. In other words, it's locally isotopic to by a line. We call F of S1 the knot. So the important thing here is the fact that it's an embedding from S1 to R3. This other condition is not really important, but it rules out some ugly cases. So this approximated by lines condition is not really the point, but it rules out some ugly uh, pathological examples. For example, this here is called a wild knot, and uh, it's, it's not the kind of objects we want to be dealing with. And the point here is that at this little limit point here, the knot cannot be approximated by a line. It doesn't really have a finite derivative there. It's going to be spinning so fast that no line can approximate it. But yeah, the important part is it's a map from the circle into R3, which never intersects itself. Uh, so when are two knots the same knot? Here's the definition. Two knots, K1 and K2, are equivalent if there exists an isotopy F from R3 cross 0, 1 into R3, which takes, be a little loose with language here, K1 to K2. So this basically means what you think it means. You're moving the knot around in this three-dimensional space, and it ends up at the end of all of this, right on top of the other knot. So this can be a little bit difficult to deal with. Three-dimensional objects, you know, they don't fit on paper, and so we are always looking for ways to represent them on paper. And the way we do that is called a knot diagram. So... Here is uh, the, the observation that lets us do this. In fact, we can squish a knot down to 
R2 cross negative epsilon epsilon. So I have this string sitting inside of three-dimensional space. I'll just illustrate what I mean with this belt again here. Here it's, it's sitting all around three-dimensional space and I can just essentially squish it down, squish it down, and squish it down. And now it's pretty much lying in a plane, except there are some places here where the, the belt is going to pass on top of itself. And there I can't get everything to really be flat. So that's the idea. And the consequence of that observation is that we can encode a knot in R2 using a knot diagram, which is what I was drawing for you before. So formally, it's a four valent graph. So that means four vertices at each, uh, sorry, four edges at each vertex. So four valent graph with over, under, crossing information. So for example, here is a knot encoded as a diagram. So I'm squishing it into R2. And when I go to squish both of these pieces into R2, one of them needs to pass under the other one. And that's what I'm encoding here. So here's a knot. And in fact, this actually happens to be the trefoil as well. So what's this four valent condition? Uh, here's the idea. I have a vertex essentially here and there are four edges coming off of this vertex and the rule is that some strand is going to pass over the other strand and we encode that by drawing it what, what it should look like. So manipulating these objects is easier than uh, manipulating objects in three space. But anytime you encode something as a diagram or anything else, you want to know what are the allowed moves because the diagram isn't the object. So what moves on the diagram correspond to moves on your original object. And here, the answer to this is the Reitermeister moves. So there are three Reitermeister moves. And they're called R1. So if I have a knot diagram, which looks like this, again, I'll uh, pull out the belt for illustrations. So here's the picture. I have uh, just sort of a, a loop in the belt. I can always pull that tight, right, to get rid of it. And so this should be the same thing as just a straight line. There's also a move called Reitermeister 2. And it looks like if I ever have two pieces crossing like this, here I'll maybe illustrate with my uh, hands, you can always just move them sort of off of each other. And finally, there's this move R3. And 
Uh, this one's a little more involved, but it's going to, again, look like something you that, that just makes sense to a human. Um, so I can move that strand, which is passing above the other two strands, downwards. So that's what this is saying. I could just move this down, or I could move that up. And it turns out that these are pretty much all of the moves you need. Uh, but before we get there, let me just show you an example of some of these in action. Uh, well, since these moves correspond to isotopies, Any two diagrams related by these moves represent equivalent knots. So for example, uh, here is a diagram over over under under okay and you can pause the video here and maybe try to work out some Reitermeister moves your intuition should tell you this probably isn't a knotted object it's the unknot and in fact let's prove that well if I do a Reitermeister 2 move let me just scroll up so you can see what that means. That means if I ever have a clasp like this, I can undo the clasp. And here is the clasp. And if I do that, what I get is something that looks like this. And then there was the Reitermeister 1 move, which lets you undo kinks. And if I do that, I get exactly this picture, which I define to be the unknot. So this knot is unknotted. Great. So now we have a way of telling when two knots are equivalent. You do some Reitermeister moves to them, and uh, it shows you that the knots are equivalent. So here's a theorem. Due to Reitermeister, Alexander, and Briggs, Reitermeister gets most of the credit. Uh, it says that two knots, K1 and K2, are equivalent if and only if. They have diagrams related by Reitermeister 1, Reitermeister 2, Reitermeister 3, and planar isotopy. So by that, I just mean, uh, you know, you can always just take a string and just wiggle it without introducing any new crossings or passing through any crossings. You could always just wiggle the diagrams a little bit. The important thing is Reitermeister 1, Reitermeister 2, and Reitermeister 3 are the extra ingredients. So this is a planar isotopy. So this is a great theorem, but here are some problems. Well, given two knots, which are equivalent, how many moves do you need to do to get between them? 
In other words, like, when should you give up trying to do moves? And it turns out that this is like a very, very hard mathematical problem. We do actually have some results in this direction, but uh, the number of moves like outnumbers the atoms in the universe by a huge margin. It's something like even if each atom in the universe had a universe inside of it and you counted up all of the atom universes, it, it would you'd uh, exceed <laughs> uh, that by the number of Reitermeister moves you'd need to do. So that's one big problem. And here is another problem, which is related to that. How can you tell when two knots are not equivalent? So if they are equivalent, you can find right and moves. If they're not, well, then you can't find right and moves. But how would I prove to you that you can't find right and moves? Well, uh, that's going to be the main subject of the rest of the class. And it starts with this observation. If K1 and K2 are equivalent knots, then if I cut out K1 and I cut out K2 from R3, then they will be homeomorphic. If you'd like, you can trace through the definition of isotopy and see that this is the case, but I think it's pretty intuitive. Uh, and so, if we can distinguish the complements So that's what we call R3 minus K1, the complement of K1. We can distinguish the knots. Well, how do we tell apart spaces in this class? So far, we have one big tool. Our favorite way of distinguishing spaces so far at least is pi 1 so the question is how do we compute pi 1 of the complement of the knots And the answer is called the wording of presentation. So what this is, is uh, the wording of presentation takes in a knot diagram and outputs a presentation for the fundamental group of R3 minus the knot. So there's actually a little bit of auxiliary data. It's a small amount of auxiliary data is an orientation of the knot. But this isn't going to affect the final answer. Essentially, it'll, it'll just change the answer by our choice of generators. So this is going to be a presentation. So we need generators and relations. Here's where the generators come from. We're going to place a base point. Uh, 
sort of above the diagram. So you're looking at a knot diagram, you should think of the base point as being like right in front of your face. And draw loops around each connected component of the diagram. Uh, and remember, I'm going to orient this diagram. Uh, and I'll explain what I mean by this, but I'm going to be using a right-hand rule. This is not the, uh, the point to get stuck on, but... Okay, so I have my diagram here of my trefoil. I'm going to put the base point over here. Uh just because I can't really draw a point right in front of my face. But, uh, so I orient my diagram, which basically just means pick an arrow direction and go around the whole diagram, okay? And now what I'm gonna do is look at all the connected components of this diagram. So for example, I'll trace this out in, in green here. This strand is one connected component, and I'll call it alpha one. And then there's another connected component here, alpha two. I'll draw that in right here as well. It's alpha two. And then there's another one on top called alpha three. And so I'm gonna need three loops going around each of the connected components. And I want to orient the loop so that if I curl my fingers in the direction of the loop, my thumb is pointing in the direction of the knot. So for example, here is one such loop. And I'm gonna orient it this way because when I do, and I curl my fingers in, my thumb points along with the knot. I mean, this is a small detail, but I should tell you what, what you really need to do. So I also need a uh, loop here. And now I need to start naming these. The one that goes around alpha one, I'll call X one. And the one that goes around alpha two, I'll call X two. And then finally, I need a loop that runs around alpha three. And this is gonna make it a little messy here. Uh, so there it is. I should go over here and over here. I need to orient these loops. Uh, So this blue one goes like this, and this green one comes like this. All right, and there we have it. Three loops, and I claim that those are the generators from the fundamental group. We'll give a sketch of how this proof works later, but for now I just wanted to show you how to execute the algorithm. So, uh, pi one of R3 minus what I have here is the trefoil, is generated by x1, x2, and x3. So those are the generators. Now how about the relations? Uh, well, first of all, we can assign a sign to each oriented crossing by, uh, well, first of all, I'll just draw them in. 
This is my strand alpha i plus 1, alpha i. And in the end, this is going to be what's called a plus crossing. There's something else that can happen, though, which is that this alpha k can come across. And then alpha i turns to alpha i plus 1, but going the other way. And this is a minus crossing. And there's a lot of ways uh, you can like distinguish between these. Maybe you'll figure out your own favorite way to do it. Here's how I do it. Uh, I take the top strand and rotate it counterclockwise until it aligns with the bottom strand. And then if the arrows match, then it's a plus. And then if the arrows clash, then it's a minus. So something formal you could write down using matrices and all that, but I just like uh, things like this. So if you look at the left-hand side here, and grab that top strand and start twisting it counterclockwise, the arrows match up when they what the first instance that the two strands coincide. On the other hand, if you take the top strand on the right and start twisting counterclockwise, the arrows are going to run into each other and they clash. And so that's, it's a, that's a minus sign. So if we zoom in, on a positive crossing, we can see a relation among the loops. Uh, so again, here is this positive crossing. And so I have my loop this is XK and this is XI and then I'm also going to have a loop up here so this was strand alpha K this is strand alpha I the indices increase. This is now alpha i plus 1 in the direction of the knot. So I'm going to have a loop also, which looks like, uh, oops, that, and this is x k plus 1. And now I'm going to draw in one more loop which looks like this okay and here's the picture we need so on one hand this purple loop is xk together with xi. So here it looks like xk followed by xi. To see this, just take that big purple loop and sort of squish it down in the middle and you'll see that it exactly just wraps around the red loop and wraps around the green loop. But now I'll clean this picture up a little bit. This purple loop can essentially slide over that whole crossing over there. And so here, 
it looks like that. And now from this perspective, remember this is alpha i plus one and this is alpha k. And so from this perspective, this purple loop looks like x i plus one followed by x k. So I'll write these out in purple so we can Keep track of them. So here it looks like xk, xi, and here it first goes around alpha i plus 1, so xi plus 1, and then it goes around alpha k, so xk. And these loops are clearly homotopic. So xk xi is homotopic to xi plus 1 xk, which is usually written as xi plus 1 is equal to xk together with xi followed by xk inverse. So to get this, I just multiplied by xk inverse on the right of the previous relationship. Great. And similarly, at a negative crossing, we have that xi plus 1, it looks very similar, except it's conjugated sort of in the other direction. The xk inverse shows up first, is the only difference. And it turns out that these are all the relations. All right, so let me summarize everything in this theorem. So let K in R3 be a knot, and let D be a diagram for K, with N strands, that is N connected components of the diagram, alpha 1 to alpha N, let XI the loop around alpha i and let r i be the relation at each crossing given by Either xi plus 1 is xk, xi, xk inverse at a positive crossing, or xi plus 1 is xk inverse, xi, xk at a minus crossing. Then, pi 1 of R3 minus K has this presentation, X1 to Xn, together with the relations as above, R1 to Rn. And here's just a little addendum that's not a big deal, but can help sometimes. Uh, moreover, any of the relations can be any any one relation can be omitted. So there's some redundancy here. And this is still a presentation.
for pi 1 of r3 minus k. Great. So that's a lot to take in, but actually executing the algorithm is not that hard once you get a knack for figuring out the signs of crossings. And then once you do, you just have to remember which, which relation do you add at each crossing. And the way I remember it is at a negative crossing, the inverse goes first. Inverse is kind of like a negative relation. And so at the negative crossing, you do the inverse first. At the positive crossing, you do the positive conjugation. So let's see an example of this. So here is our trefoil as before. This one is maybe a little different. It's called the left-handed trefoil. Uh, <laughs> I always struggle to draw these. Okay. There we go. Okay, now let's orient this knot. Again, this will not affect the final answer. But it is necessary for the computation. All right. So you don't even need to draw in those loops. They get in the way. Um, pi 1 of R3 minus this knot is, okay, so there's going to be an alpha 1 here, that's one strand, alpha 2 here, that's another strand, and alpha 3 up here, that's another strand. So we're going to get our usual loops, x1, x2, and x3, so that, and we're going to get a couple relations here. So the relations happen at each crossing. Here's one crossing, okay. Now we have to decide, is this a positive crossing or a negative crossing? And if I take that top strand and I rotate it counterclockwise, the arrows clash. And so that's a negative crossing. And what do I have there? Well, I have that uh, alpha 2 is turning into alpha 3. So I get x3 is equal to x2 conjugated by x1 positively. So, oh, sorry, negatively. It was a negative crossing. Great. All right. Next crossing. If I turn this top strand counterclockwise, again, things are going to clash. And what's happening is alpha 1 is turning into alpha 2. And so x2 is equal to uh, x1 conjugated by x3 negatively. And finally, here is our last crossing. And again, you'll find that this is a negative crossing. And here, x3 is turning into x1 in the end, I'm going to have x1, and it comes from x3 conjugated by x2 negatively. And there you have it. That is a presentation for the fundamental group of the complement of this trefoil knot. Uh, and here is maybe another trivial example. Here's the unknot, u, and pi 1 of r3 minus u is, well, I'm going to get a single generator, and there's no crossings, so there's no relations. And we know this group well. It's the integers. But here is a tough question. I'm trying to tell these knots apart, and I have two presentations here. How can I tell that this first presentation doesn't actually represent the trivial group? 
So are these knots the same? Well, here's a related question. Are the groups the same? And the next little bit, I'm going to show you how to see that these groups are honestly different. So let's take this presentation, simplify it a little bit, and see what we have. All right. Now, recall that I can always throw away one of these relations. So I'll throw out the second relation, just ignore that. And also, I have x3 in terms of x1 and x2, so I can get rid of that generator, essentially. Uh, so pi1 of r3 minus k, I'll simplify it to x1, and I'll replace x3 by x1 inverse x2 x1. So that will mean x1 is x2 inverse times, sub this in, x1 inverse x2 x1 times x2. This has like a slightly nice symmetric way to write it, which is that uh, if I multiply by x2, uh, and then I multiply by x1 on the left. So I get x1, x2, x1 is equal to x2, x1, x2. So it's looking a little more simple. And now I'm starting to doubt that this is the integers. But it's still not completely clear. So here's the general way one detects the non-triviality or non-integerness of a group is you look at homomorphisms out of the group. But before I get a nice homomorphism out of here, I need to change my generators. So now let P equal x1, x2, and Q be equal to x1, x2, x1. Here's a question. Is this still a generating set for my group? It is because uh, x1 is p inverse times q. You can just check that directly very easily. And x2, well, I'll just write it first of all silly, uh, sillily as x1 inverse times x1, x2. Now, x1 inverse is q inverse times p, and x1, x2 is p, and so this is q inverse times p squared. And what's the point of all this? Well, I've written x1 and x2, my generating set, in terms of p and q. So these elements get the generators, and therefore they are generators. So p and q generate, and the relation uh, x1, x2, x1 equals x2, x1, x2. Well, let me just multiply on the left and right here. So I get x1, x2, x1 times x1, x2, x1 is equal to, uh, now I'm just going to multiply by x1, x2, x1 on the left, on, sorry, on the right as well, x1, x2, x1, x2, x1, x2. And I'll group things like this. And so what I get here is that q times q is equal to p times p times p. And so, in the end of all this, 
we have the presentation, which is going to be most useful to us. Pi 1 of R3 minus this naught here is generated by P and Q so that P cubed is equal to Q squared. And why this is helpful for us is because this looks a lot like the dihedral group uh, D3, which is R and S, so that R cubed equals 1, well, is equal to S squared is equal to 1, and RS is equal to SR squared. And in fact, we can get a homomorphism. which is surjective from pi 1 of r3 minus this knot here to the dihedral group on three elements by, I just need to specify where the generators go. And you could probably see what I should do. f of p is r and f of q is equal to s. Now what do I need to check? I need to check for this to be a well-defined homomorphism that f of p cubed is equal to f of q squared and in, in fact f of p cubed and f of q squared are both the identities. So this is a well-defined homomorphism and you could see from there that it's surjective. And so here's the punchline. Well, <laughs> a couple more buildups. First of all, D3 is not abelian. Right? RS is SR squared. Those don't commute. And also, any map out of an abelian group has an abelian image and finally pi 1 of r3 minus the unknot which we've shown to be the integers is of course abelian and so finally our punchline The trefoil is not equivalent to the unknot. And so this object really is an honestly knotted object. And just to walk you through the logic here, we computed the fundamental group of the complement of the trefoil to be this group, uh, PQ with PQ, P cubed is equal to Q squared. Now there's a subjective map to a non-abelian group. So in other words, whatever our group is of pi one of R three minus K, it's definitely not abelian. However, the fundamental group of the unknot complement is abelian. So these knots can never be the same. Great. So that's going to do it for now. Next class, we are going to shift our perspective entirely. We are going to move away from the fundamental group, and we're going to learn new tools that allow us to distinguish higher dimensional objects and find higher dimensional holes in spaces. Thanks, and I'll see you again next time.